I've been involved with Partners in Learning since uh, about 2006. It's been a great privilege to be involved, and I've been involved at many levels between the Innovative uh, Teacher Programme and the Innovative Schools Programme, and then from that we, I progressed into the Innovative Teaching and Learning Research, so the ITL Research, which developed out of the Schools Programme. Greg alluded to this earlier. Uh, and he pointed out to people that this is, this is really what, what's going to be important over the coming years and we need to pay attention to it. It's the fact that now we're looking at complex communication and expert thinking rather than routine cognitive and routine manual. Those routine skills are something that can be automated. And we need then to be looking to the future and saying, how can we prepare our children to enter a world, as Greg said earlier as well, into a workplace where jobs that they're doing that we can't even imagine, using tools that haven't yet been invented. So how are we going to get them ready for that type of world, to live in that type of world? We're going to make sure that they have to be expert thinkers and that they're capable of complex communication because they're work going to be working in multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary teams around the world trying to solve problems that they're going to inherit from us and other generations. So we need to say, how can we prepare them to live in that world? So that was the question that sort of uh, was the impetus behind as well, the innovative teaching and learning. How do we actually look at what type of learning environments can we design that will enable these skills to develop? So these are the skills that we're looking at that children and future learners will need. Knowledge building, self-regulation and assessment, collaboration and skilled communication. And how can they operationalize those and galvanize those together to be able to solve complex problems in a global awareness way and use ICT or use digital tools effectively? So they are generally the, what's often referred to as 21st century learning skills or skills to the 21st century. But these are skills that we have needed to have to be informed learners for many generations, except what, what happened was there was only a tiny minority of people in the past developed those skills, and they became the leaders in the community, or they became the leaders in industry or the other professions. Now it's not going to be enough that only a tiny minority have them. Everybody has to have them in order to live and work in a complex world. So that's why we're going to have to radically change the education system we have and redesign it, because it's not going to be fit for purpose for the students in the coming generations. So this is the research, this is the, these are the countries that it's, it's, it's taking part in at the moment. But more significantly, there's 45 countries using the methods. These methods are available free of charge uh, on the PLSR, and it's on the P Partners in Learning Network as well, that you can actually look at, take the surveys, take the, the, the learning activities, and the professional development. There's four levels of professional development you can engage in as well. And you can actually run alongside and be actually in tandem with some of this research. Just to let you know that it's very, very complex research. It's not just survey. It's not just um, questionnaires. It's actually classroom observations. There have been uh, learning activities developed, student work, and we'll go into some of that later as well. And you can look at the numbers here. So it's quite a good representation. What we're trying to look at as well is we understand that the education system needs to change. But some of the research was looking at the school leadership and the culture. How do you actually examine the school leadership? What does it look like? And then, but more importantly, innovative teaching practices. What do innovative teaching practices look like? And how we understand it's a complex ecosystem. We do realize that you can't have one without the other. Each interacts with one another as well. Um, but more importantly, what I'm going to focus on here is that the innovative teaching practices, how do they link with the individuals and the skills and for life and work today? How are they actually interrelated? Is there a, a relationship between them? And that was one of the questions we looked at in the research. What do we mean? I think what has to happen is we need to have a definition of what innovative pedagogies are. So looking at this research here, the innovative pedagogies we looked at was, okay, Student-centered pedagogies. And what do we mean by student-centered pedagogies? Well, are they personalized? Or is it one size fits all, okay? Collaborative, is there opportunities for collaborative learning? Knowledge building as against just knowledge infusion, okay? It, do the children get an opportunity to actually construct knowledge for themselves? 
And self-regulation, do they get an opportunity to actually set their own learning goals? Do they regulate their own learning behavior? Do they know when they've attained those goals? Do they actually reprioritize what they need to do? So do they get an opportunity to do that? So that's the student-centered pedagogies. Extending learning, what do we mean by extending learning? What it is is, do they get an opportunity to solve complex problems over this course of their school, school career? Do they get an opportunity to actually engage with complex problems that are real and authentic and have a connection to the outside world? Rather than sort of things that are just made up, why should I be interested in it? It's a real problem that I can tackle, get my teeth into, and that I can make a difference in the world and in understanding the world around me. Then do we have 24-7 learning opportunities? Or does learning just happen from nine to four? Do we have an opportunity to engage in learning 24-7, 365? And is there a seamless connection between the formal and informal systems between home and school? So that we actually do away with that sort of relevance conundrum that Greg was, was referring to. So that school is actually a relevant part of my life. That there's not a disconnect between my home, my life outside school, and school that there is actually a, a, a continuum across it. And then, very, very importantly, is this global and cultural understanding. We live in a connected world. People said before, and I thought it was very interesting when we were talking about sort of, you know, the, the world is a village, you know, and it's getting smaller. But if you look at it the other way, for each individual, the world is now a bigger place because I can now connect with. Before, it was, uh, I don't know if some people are looking at the, some of the series that's on television, The Village where it was so seldom did you actually get to move beyond your own village or your uh, own town. Whereas over the years now, travel has now shrunk the world, so I can actually travel around the world. But more importantly, I don't even have to leave my own desk or my own classroom or my own home. I can connect. And for example, last week could have a meeting with, there were lots of people on the same call and they were from right across the globe. I'm very lucky where we live in Ireland because it's great, the time zone's about 2.30. For other people, it's six in the morning. For other people, it's midnight. Okay, so we're great where we are here, ideally suited for global connection. So that's what I'm talking about, that sort of global connection, that our, our individual worlds have got much, much bigger in comparison to what the life of even our parents, well, my parents, were like, not yours, okay? Um, then we're looking at ICT integration or ICT infusion. What does it look like? Not just by educators, but by the students themselves. Too often we've been in schools where we see the technology is in, ha is in the hands of the teachers and not in the hands of the students. So it's innovative uses and, and technology infusion by educators and students. And this is a big question, basic uses versus higher level uses. And we'll sh I'll, I'll throw up that graph again that Greg showed that looks at low, low level uses of ICT and high level uses of ICT. We see lots, even in, in, in the most sort of what they call innovative schools, they look at very basic uses of ICT, where they're using them for presentation, word processing, etc. But they're not using them for actual knowledge building and creativity. I mean, we're still shocked. I mean, I, I work in St. Patrick's College, and we're still shocked. They talked, I, was, I started working there 15 years ago, when, you know, IT2000 and everything else was being launched. And everybody said, oh, just wait. Just wait. I mean, when Mick was saying it, everybody was saying, wait till they've actually come through, you know, second level. Wait till you're actually getting the kids who have started at primary and have come from primary right through second level. I'm getting those kids now, and I don't see any difference, okay? The only difference I see is that they're very good at Facebook, okay? That's about it, all right? Uh, and what worries me then is that uh, they're very good at, what I mean very good at Facebook, I would rephrase that, they spend an awful lot of time on Facebook, okay? But well, we're shocked at the lack of understanding of the privacy issues, uh, the lack of, they don't understand the sort of the privacy boundaries, what privacy means, uh, the fact that they actually tell their entire lives online, and we're saying, you know, you shouldn't put anything online that you wouldn't tell your granny, or that you wouldn't have on the front pages of the mail, you know? And how uh, even their lack of understanding of sort of identity fraud, how it can actually come back to bite them in 10 years' time, you know, those sort of issues, that sort of uh, sensible and sort of interrogation of um, these, these sort of information age. In other words, to be able to create their own digital identity. What does it mean? And into the future. So I'm still shocked at the 
these children now, we're there 15 years, so technically the students I have, we have at the moment, age 18, 19, they came through primary. They came through second level since IT 2000. And I'm not seeing any difference. So that's what's frightening. And if we don't sort of wake up and really tackle the issue, we're, we're one of the, uh, the words there, maybe you didn't notice it when, when, when Mick had the slide up, it was called infoosity. So in other words, we're actually sort of, it's, we're drowning in information, absolutely and utterly drowning in information. So what, what we don't have is the ability to interrogate that information, to evaluate it, to synthesize it, and actually then create our own understandings and knowledge of it. And we need to start putting that into place. And these students that are going to come up shortly, they'll show you the type of stuff they're, they're engaged in and how they're critically analyzing the knowledge and information that's out there. So that's what we're looking at. This is, uh, when I saw this slide first, I, I remember looking at it and saying, it looks like a foot, you know? Maybe other people don't, but I think it looks like a foot. But what it basically is looking at, on this axis here, you have the students' skills, their 21st century skills, the, the development of the students' 21st century skills. And here was the learning activity score here. So what we're looking at is, if teachers develop innovative learning activities, okay, what would the 21st century skills score look like? And the 21st century skills we're looking at are knowledge construction, problem solving, collaboration, skilled communication, okay? Those sort of things. And if you look at the, 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 the clusters, you will actually see, and it seems like a no-brainer, that if educators develop 21st century learning activities that ask for 21st century skills, then students will develop them. But if you as teachers don't design learning activities that demand the use of these skills, they're not going to develop. They just don't develop by osmosis, okay? So you have a crucial role in developing these 21st century skills. This is what I refer to as well. When you're using technology, this is the um, information. And this information came from these schools were picked, and the countries themselves picked them, as like typically innovative schools in their countries. And even if, so these are the scores from what countries termed innovative schools. And look at the, the uses. Basic uses of ICT. So you're looking at finding information on the internet, routine skills, taking tests, etc. Very little uses of high level developing simulations, working with others outside of the classroom, creating multimedia presentations, collaborating with their peers on learning activities. Very little use of this using technology. And these were supposed to be what was called innovative schools. So if these are the innovative schools, what are other schools doing? So that's what makes me sort of, you know, wary about what's going on and what technology is being used for. So, and, the children are going to go up and come up now shortly, and in the projects that they're, they're talking about and describing, these are the ITL learning activity dimensions. There's a whole professional development suite of activities designed around these. But what really came out of the ITL research was a definition of what the 21st century skills are, what do they look like, and then they were coded on dimensions zero to four so that there's a progression, how you can progress from one level to the next. So these are the skills. So when the children are talking about the work, think about, did the children have opportunities to share responsibility and make substantive decisions with other people? Is their work interdependent? Were they required to construct and apply knowledge? And is that knowledge interdisciplinary rather than siloed? Do the, are they passive consumers of ICT or are they active users and designers with a, that, that design products for an authentic audience? And then do the learning activities, do they require problem solving in the real world? Is the activity long term? Think of the number of classes that only happen in a 15 or 20 minute slot, but is the activity long term? Do they plan and assess their own work? And then, are students, students required to communicate their ideas regarding a concept or, or issue? So think of those 21st century skills now uh, as I invite the children from St. Augustine School to come up and talk to us about their project. So we're going to have Paul, and we're going to have Harry, and we're going to have Aoife, and we're going to have Luke. And they're going to come up now, and we're going to hand it over to them.
to them. What do you want to learn about? How do you want to learn? These are questions we ask in Clontuskert. Our project, Life in a Ringfort, was 10 months in the making. The students from third to sixth class wrote the script. We want to do a project on Ringforts since there are over 204 Ringforts in our parish of Clontuskert. In fact, five students in the school have Ringforts on their land. We visited a local Ringfort in Gertnahorna with local archaeologist Fiona Maguire. Fiona taught us lots about ring forts and she pointed out places where nettles were since nettles grow in disturbed places of the ground and she thinks there might have been huts there. And she also got us to stamp in the ground to see was there a souterrain there. A souterrain is an underground tunnel which the people used to keep their food cool and also used it as an uh, attack if people attacked them as an escape route. Um, um, from there on, we wrote and acted and directed our own script. I'll pass it on to Harry. We began by creating a timeline of Irish history. This helped us to see where Ringforth fitted into Irish history. Miss Murray's mother, a history teacher in Clonmel, lent us some history books and archaeology magazines that we read and found out as much information as possible. We worked individually and in groups and podcasted all the work we found, all the information we found. We were really interested in the finds from that time in the bogs, um, as we have a local bog in Kelly's Grove, which the Somerset Horde was found in. Did you know that they found butter in the bog that was fully preserved and that bodies uh, found in the bog were sometimes buried in cyst burials. This means that their knees were folded up and their valuables were buried around them. This helped us to learn about their appearance and what type of clothes they would have worn. Women used to wear makeup. Um, they used a herb called rheum to redden their lips and they put lime in their hair to lighten it. We also learned about being a member of the Tuha. We visited Craganown in County Clare to see a fully functioning ring fort. Our guide Annika showed us how they wove their clothes and how they made wattle and daub to cover the walls of the huts. They had crops growing using the same crops they would have used at that time. We could really see why they only lived until the age of about 30 because they had no chimneys in the huts and they used ash soap to clean themselves. We read novels from Galway County Library based in the Bronze Age. Third and fourth read Newlander Secret Wolf by Cora Harrison and fifth and sixth read The Drew's Tune by Orla Melling. We podcasted a synopsis of each chapter and all of these podcasts can be found on our school website www.clontusker.schoolnet.ie Hanley Woolen Mills outside Nina and County Tipperary donated materials which would be appropriate to the style back then. Our parents came in and with the help of um, cost, our costume designers, we made outfits for the, our actors in our film. Using all this information we found, we created a script. Now I'll hand it over to Paul. We then studied the art of filmmaking. Well, then we we then decided which we parts we wanted to audition for, actors or crew. We learned the music, Harry's Game by Clan Ads, as we thought this would be suitable music for the time. When everybody got their parts, we could start to practice and we made a storyboard so we could visualize how the film would look when we were finished. Kevin Cunningham from Kilcrease Development Group came to the school to help us build a willow hut on the school grounds to so we could see how the Ringfort dwellers lived. We had three student editors from the school who edited the film and all, the, all this information can be found on our school blog www.clontuskert.schoolnet.ie Clontuskert Heritage 
Clontusker Parish has a strong heritage group who have published a book called Clontusker Parish Glimpses into its Past. Their editor, Joe Malloy, is always on hand to give us help with all of our pro projects. Jamie Callahan gave us permission to go on his land in Grotna Horner so as we could visit a ring fort. Marie Mannion and Grony Smith are heritage officers in Galway County Council who often give us maps of our local area that we could study. We travelled to Sloga Octi, which is Galway and Clare's heritage meeting, to engage with heritage enthusiasts, and this made our project much easier. Engaging with these heritage enthusiasts has meant that we, our school has a strong connection throughout Galway, the community in Galway. This has meant uh, local, national and global support and audiences for all of our projects. Today we have 54,000 hits on our school blog. I'll now hand you over to Aoife. In December we won the Galway Mayor's Award and won the Aircom Junior Spiders Award. This is a huge achievement since our school has only 30 students. The junior room, juniors to second class. The senior room, third class to sixth class. This means we work a lot in pairs and groups and we are used to peer coaching and helping each other. We are very independent about using technology and, every and use handhelds and laptops er every day. We don't forget about handwriting and often write letters to our friends, friends we met around the world through our school blog and various projects. I think that's a fabulous example of learning in action. And I think if you reflect on the skills that we talked about, 21st century skills, uh, you'll see that not only are they skilled communicators, they can come up and talk about their project, but they also uh, actually made history come alive. They investigated, but they investigated in real terms. They actually contacted their heritage group. They got archeologists on board. They got the librarians on board. They researched themselves, and then they put it into action. They actually built the same things as would have been available in Craig and Owen. And they began, they actually made a film. And in order to be able to, to make their film as authentic as possible, all this research came to life for them. And they didn't use the materials that were available. They actually went and researched the types of materials that would have been available at the time. So I think they have a real, true, rich understanding of what history, what it means to be alive and where their heritage is coming from. So it's no wonder they actually got uh, the awards and the accolades that they achieved. I think learning at that depth, and that project took 10 months. It wasn't the workbook where it was fill in page six and move on to page eight. It was deep, long projects that required deep learning. Not this skimming the surface, but deep projects. They learned as well all the skills of collaboration, how to actually break down the task, what to do next, to interrogate the information. And I'd have every faith in the world that these children, when they grow up, will be able to project man manage anything that's thrown at them. And I'd really like to congratulate them on their fabulous work and their teacher, Kate Murray. So how do we get and how do we help people to get from where they're at and to use the tools in creative ways? And this is where Microsoft Partners in Learning has built on the research and they've actually gathered together a range of tools that teachers can actually capitalise on and use. We use them in the college. We actually get all our students as pre-service teachers to actually log on to the Partners in Learning network and we get them to download the learning suite. And this is the learning suite here. And you'll see there's a range of programmes that are available that you can actually use different tools to create things, to collaborate with, research and study, and teach. And the children are going to demo some in a minute. The ones that the, our students love is uh, the things that they're going to actually demo, auto collage and photosynth, etc. This one is terrific, Songsmith. I have no music background whatsoever, but I have seen people who are really good at music put this really into action. And on the Partners in Learning Network, there's another of the innovative teachers from Wales who actually then put together a fabulous suite he and his children actually put together a fabulous suite of videos, etc., how to use this songsmith in action. So it's a really good piece. Kodu, those of you who are interested in coding, 
and can actually capitalize then on the get on the place on the um, the Xbox etc can actually make Kodu come alive because you can actually make your own programming and there's a lots of very good tutorials here as well uh, movie maker our stu all our students use movie maker as well to actually put into action and it's amazing for the first time ever we're working with first years in the college and they've just finished their school placement and we've got them to actually use one of the tools and make an artifact with the children and they've all done really really well at it so the, I keep mixing out which one I have to use here. Okay. These, as I said, it's just you can see there in, 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 in more, more clearly the type of ones that are available. Uh, the Windows Live, this one here, Windows Live SkyDrive. Uh, I'd be dead if I didn't have the SkyDrive because what I can do is I can access my documents. I can have them online there. What's really great now about the new phone is, let's say if I take a picture, uh, and I only learned this last week, I can take a picture with my, my, my phone uh, it automatically syncs with my SkyDrive. I can then open my laptop, and on my laptop, I have my picture sitting in my SkyDrive as well. So it's a seamless integration of tools, which is fantastic, especially when, uh, if you're like me, uh, when I used to have lots of memory sticks, and I have memory sticks all over the place, now I can have it in the SkyDrive, and I can access it wherever I am. Um, so what I would like, these, as I say, I'm not going to go into all the tools. I'm going to get the children to come up now and demo. We're going to look at Photosynth, which is a really exciting uh, piece of software where you can make really virtual sort of virtual tours of places. I'm going to get them to look at auto collage. This goes down really, really well. Uh, and we're also going to look at Windows Movie Maker.